reading from 1 John. Dear friends, let us have love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not now know God, but God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. True. Not that we love God, he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now this is how we know we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God for us. As for us, God is love. Whoever loves, whoever lives in love lies, lives in God, lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear of love, but perfect love drives out fear. Word of God, word of life. If I'm down here, can you guys see me okay if I stay down here? That way I don't fall over the steps. All right. Um, so you guys know I like to start with a little bit of a little bit of humor, and I apologize if you were at the Christmas Eve services uh, at Windmill, because I used some of these before, but I came across a teacher who was asked their class, now he was asking seventh graders what they thought 30-year-olds would really want for Christmas. Now, remember, some of these just seem really odd, but just remember when you were in seventh grade, what you thought 30 was like, all right? Um, so one of the first ones that, let's see if I can get this to go. Here we go. So one of the first things was a heated blanket because their muscles be hurting. <laughs> I don't remember my muscles be hurting when I was 30, but okay. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was funny. And then... Um, you might have to do it for me, Elizabeth. It's not, it's not picking up my thing here. I like this one. The wrinkle creams. 30? Really? Come on, man. This one. You may get them old. Now, this one's pretty good. You may get them old people candles that smell like home or back then. That's not bad, right? I mean, what seventh grader has that kind of presence of mind to write something like that? Oh, sorry, I went, went to, I went ahead. Back me up, there we go. Panera bread gift cards, because people in their 30s love soup. <laughs> Once again, the wisdom of that kid. I didn't start liking soup until I was in my 30s. I remember that. Oh, some of those kids. Because their muscles, heated blanket, because their muscles be hurting. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at what God's Word has to teach us about overcoming fear, confusion, and anxiety a little bit today. And we're going to be using some elements of the Christmas story because, believe it or not, it's still Christmas, at least in the church here, it's still Christmas for one more Sunday. Uh, so we're going to use a little bit of the, the Christmas story to help us figure out what God's Word has to say about that. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Lord, as we get ready to spend a few minutes with you, we are just so thankful for this opportunity to be here, to, to come together and worship. We have a comfortable, we have a safe place to worship you, and I ask your blessings upon us as we continue with this worship service. And now as we get ready to spend some time with your word, help us remember that your word was always intended to be a gift to us, something that teaches us how to love you better, love others, receive more of you into our lives. But like with any good gift, it won't do us any good if we don't open it. So help us to open your word by having open hearts and open minds right, to what it has to show us and teach us this day. And we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So I do, I want to talk a little bit about love over fear today. Um, because, 
I'm sorry, I'm struggling to get the, the thing to work. Elizabeth, you're just gonna have to do it for me. Go to the next one for me. So what are some things that cause you to be afraid? I read an article that talked about the six biggest fear-inducing things uh, in America. This is only in America. So what do you think those, those top fear-inducing things would be? Or what are some things that cause you to be fearful? Boom, who said that? Number one, public speaking was number one. I, I was really surprised at that because I am very comfortable with it. Um, actually, no, I get a little nervous too, but public speaking was number one. What are some other things that either cause you or do you think we're fall on that list? Driving in Vegas, I love that. No, it was not on the list, but yes, especially during the holidays when everybody else comes back into town. It is a little crazy out there. It should be. I think one of the funnier ones I heard uh, at one service was he was a computer programmer, and he said, computer hackers. I was like, yeah, I don't think we're going to get that in any of the other services, but uh, for him, that was a real fear. Anything else? Death, right? I would think that would be on there. It wasn't even in the top 10. And my guess is because people that go to church are just a little bit deeper than your average American. Um, yes, it, finances. Um, not in the top six, but was in the top 10. Yeah, the fear of not being able to pay your bills. That's another big one, being alone, loneliness. Once again, not on this particular list that I was reading, but I think once again, it's because I don't, know if your average American thinks as deeply maybe as your average church-going American. Death, being alone, right? Uh, not having meaning in life. These are things that I think would cause people that tend to go a little bit deeper with their lives, uh, more fear. But people that just kind of are thinking a little bit on the more materialistic realm, heights. This was, this was number three, which just surprised the heck out of me. Going to the dentist. What? I mean, then I started thinking about who likes that jab when they start to numb you up? No one likes that, right? They always tell you, just relax. Yeah, no. Um, now that they do this little thing, now when, they, when they're starting to, and they take that and they do that with your cheek, it makes it a little bit better. Snakes, flying, spiders, and insects are all things that cause them to be afraid. Now, here's one that you wouldn't think would cause fear, but maybe it should be on the list. What about angels? Do you, angels on your list of things that you should be fearful of? Probably not, right? I understand that. Um, but when we look at scripture and the Christmas story, we see that angels actually cause quite a bit of confusion and fear. When the angel appears to Mary, right? God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to Mary. She was engaged to be married to Joseph. He appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now look at what her initial reaction was. Confused and frightened, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. I'm only giving you a couple examples. In the Christmas story, there's like four different examples of the fright and confusion that angels. So confused and frightened, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And then when we go on a little bit later uh, to Luke chapter 2, the very well-known story when the angels appear to the shepherds. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. The radiance of the Lord's glory shone around them. And they were excited. They were, what's going on? No, they were terrified. Terrified. The word used in the, in the Greek for this is it like they were fall, fallen over almost comatose, terrified. Angel produced that kind of fear in them. So maybe we need to put angels on that list along with spiders and snakes and insects. I'm not sure. Um, I read an article, geez, about two weeks ago as I was kind of preparing for a sermon back then that 2024 might be one of the most anxiety and fear-producing years that we have had in America in quite a while, which was very surprising to me because we just came out of COVID. And if I do remember correctly, COVID created quite a bit of anxiety and fear, did it not? 
And so I kind of read because it caught my eye and I was like, well, that can't be true. And so I, I read through and I was, it was kind of reading why, why would 2024 be a year of, of a lot of fear and anxiety? And they said, even though, because of the war in Ukraine, which tends to get a lot of attention, and even though they've been fighting wars in Europe for centuries, uh, it's the media environment that we live in, right? The media environment that we live in that where everything is just right in our face. So anything that happens, we feel like it's happening to us, right next to us. Somebody gets involved in a hit and run in Maine and we feel like it's happening here in Las Vegas because it's all over the news because of the 24-7 news cycle and, and kind of this new obsession with America for the news. So the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, even though Israel is, and the Palestinians or Israel and the Arabs have been fighting since their inception and even long before that, right? And so uh, the war in Sudan, all these different wars that are going on and then what's coming up in 2024? Oh, you know it. And what is the number one tool that politicians use to try to get you to vote for them? Fear, thank you. Fear of the other side. We don't just have a disagreement on the way things should be done. They're evil. They're trying to tear down the country. They're trying to destroy the country, right? You hear some of this, I call it BS, that they, they spout, right? And, and, and both sides do it. Some politicians tend to do it a little bit more than others, but both sides do it. And so all they're going to do is try to make you so afraid of the other side that you will vote for them. And now with this, kind of with this new media environment that we live in where there's just not a lot of fact checking and they can pretty much say whatever they want, right? And, and because we're not savvy enough, although my, my daughter's generation is much more savvy about weeding through some of the inaccuracies my generation, your generation tend to not be quite as savvy at that. We take a lot of this stuff for truth. And so all that stuff is going to be fear-inducing and anxiety-inducing. So I saw the point. So what do we do with that? So I've laid this out now, right? Knowing that this might be what we're going to be experiencing in 2024. What do we do with that? Well, let's go back to God's word and see if we get any clues on how to deal with what the world is going to be throwing at us. And so once again, going back to Luke 1, um, once the angel has saw that Mary's afraid, she says this, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. So keep that in your mind a little bit. Now let's go to the next one where he's talking to the angels. But the angel reassured the shepherds, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped, in, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. So with those two things in mind, right, what... Does this lead you to, what is the angel trying to do in both these situations with Mary and the shepherds to alleviate the fears? What do you see the angel doing? What? Calm the fear. Absolutely. How? By getting to think of, instead of thinking about what they're afraid of, getting them to think about Jesus, right? Both situations. Don't be afraid, Mary. You're going to give birth to a son. Right? And it goes on a little bit more to explain who that son's going to be, the Messiah. And the shepherds, don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news. I'm going to point you to Bethlehem, where the Savior has been born. Now, what I'd love for you to do is if you take out your sermon outline, it's in your bulletin there if you want. Fill in the blanks because we're going to be, it's a great way to kind of stay engaged and, and have the scriptures there in front of you as well. Um, so the point being here is that both times the angel points us away from the things here in this world that we're fearful of, and <laughs> in those situations, the angel, and instead points the person or the persons to Jesus. Not bad advice for us as well. To remember that when these fears start to come up, if we can just keep our focus on Jesus. And that's really that first point. Keep your focus on Jesus. 
in the midst of all the stuff that makes us confused, uh, anxious, or afraid, the more we focus on Jesus, the less we will focus on the things that make us afraid. And I just, uh, I know that that happens with me a lot. When I take my eyes off of Jesus, I'm not into my devotion, I'm not into my worship like I should be, I'm not spending time in prayer. Um, I tend to find the world a little bit more anxiety-inducing place, right? So I thought that that advice from Scripture was really, really good. And I think maybe one of my favorite stories of in Scripture about kind of this idea that I think illustrates it so well comes from Matthew 14. Um, a lot of you are familiar with this story, right? This is when Jesus has just fed 5,000 families with a few loaves of bread and a few pieces of fish, and now everybody's tired. They've worked really hard. There's been some teaching. They've had to distribute all the food. He sends the disciples across the lake. He goes off to pray. The disciples get caught up in a storm, and the storm is pretty big, and the waves are coming up, and they're really struggling. They're trying to row across. They're bailing really quick, and Jesus I don't know where Jesus, if he's on the shore or up on a hill, but he sees them in their struggle, so he starts going out to them on the water. He's walking to them on the water. The disciples see him, and they cry out in fear. They're not sure. He's a ghost. Is it Jesus? No, he's a ghost. It can't be him. And I keep thinking to myself, they have seen Jesus turn water into wine. They have seen him heal lepers at this point. He just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread. It's like human nature. We just don't get it sometimes, right? We just don't. And so they're like, oh, and all of a sudden Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me once again. Look at me. Look at me. Quit looking at, at your, your superstitions and your fears. Look at me. Then Peter calls him and says, Lord, if it really is you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus says. So Peter goes over the side of the boat. I'll be honest with you, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this because I'm not exactly sure. I need to probably do some more, theo, some more um, digging on this as to why Peter thinks he needs to get out of the boat and, and, and walk to Jesus. But anyway, he does. And everything's going swimmingly for a while. See what I did there? I said swimmingly. Um, so he's, and he's walking, and, and my guess is maybe when he gets far enough away from the boat that he, the boat no longer is a security blanket, to him, and now all of a sudden, it says he sees the water and the waves, right? But then he saw the strong wind and the waves, and he was terrified, and what happens? He begins to sink. Why did he begin to sink? He was just walking on water. He took his eyes off of Jesus, right? He's got his eyes on Jesus. Yes, it's me. Come on. And he's focused, and all of a sudden, he gets a little bit farther away from the boat, and oh my gosh, look at and the wind's tossing, and he starts to sink. And, and I love this. This is maybe the greatest prayer in the history of prayers. It's a prayer that I've seen done in hospital rooms. I've seen done with people who are just despairing. Save me, Lord! Help me! One of the most theologically profound prayers in the world. People say you have to have all these fancy words. You don't. You just have to cry out to God, save me, Lord. And I love this. Immediately, Jesus reaches out and grabs him. He doesn't give him a lecture. He doesn't let him sit under the water for a while or watch him sink and go, shouldn't have kept your, shouldn't have turned your eyes off me. Okay? Immediately, he grabs him. He lifts him up, and then he gives him a little bit of a lesson. Why didn't you have enough faith? Why did you doubt? You just saw me feed 5,000 people. You've walked with me for over a year now, you've seen me do all of these things. Why do you still doubt? And he brings him in the boat and he calms the storm. When Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he was doing the impossible. He was walking on water. And I think this is a beautiful image of Christmas. Jesus reaching down into our world. Right into a world that sometimes where we're we're confused and we're like, Lord, we don't know what's going on. We, we're just, we're overwhelmed by the waves and by the wind and by the storms in our lives. And Christmas is Jesus coming in to the world in the very person of himself and grabbing our hands and saying, I've got you. Don't forget that I'm here with you. You've taken your eyes off me. Yes, 
That's human nature to do so. But immediately, I'm, I am here for you. And I love that from Isaiah 7 because I think that's one of my favorite Christmas prophecies. The Lord himself will give a sign. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? And isn't that Christmas? God with us. God coming into the world to hold on to us in the very person of himself, giving up heaven, giving up omnipotence to take on flesh, to be cold, to be tired, to be scared, right? To be all the things that humanity can be. He gave that all up. If that is not an example of God's love for us, I don't know what is. To give up all of that just so your creation would know how much you care about it. And I just, and I love that image of that kind of grabbing the hand, right? Of pulling Peter out of the water, pulling us up out of our darkness and into the light. And so this leads me to my next couple of points, and I'm gonna go over them real quick. Right. The first thing, if you wanna increase that love in your life, then just simply increase your exposure to God. You increase the love in your life, that love that pulls the fear back, that pushes the fear away by increasing your exposure to God. That's why I'm glad you're here. This is one of the ways we increase our exposure to God, by worship. Another way is through Bible study. Another way is through coming together uh, in, in small groups or in fellowship or in service to other people in God's name. All of these different ways. Prayer are ways that we continue to increase our exposure to God. And then as we increase our exposure to God, we increase our exposure to God's love. And here's a secret, and this is really important, and I hope you'll write this one down, because the secret is that love is a great fear killer. You want to take care of your fears, get more love in your life. Love overcomes fear every time. Now, we're never gonna have perfect love, um, so we're never gonna be without fear, but the more love we have in our lives, the less fear we're gonna have. And one of the best ways to increase that love is by increasing our exposure to God in all the ways that we talked about. Maybe there's some ways I didn't even mention that you are finding that you are able to increase your exposure to God, bring more God into your life. The more you do that, the less you're gonna have fear and confusion. You're gonna be able to push that fear back. Um, I think one of the best texts about this was the one that David read for us earlier. I, I kind of shortened a little bit of it just to bring out some of the key points. Would you guys read it with me? It's, it's up on the screen, but it's also here in your bulletin. Let's read this text from 1 John 4, bits and pieces of 7 through 18 together. It reads, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Look at this. For love comes from God. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. If we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The more we live in God, the more our love grows. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If you are filling in the blanks, will you do me a favor, will you circle a couple of things or underline whatever is most convenient for you. God is love right there about the, the fourth line down and towards the middle. God is love, right? More exposure to God, more exposure to love. And then a little bit farther, like kind of towards the end, it says the more we live in God, the more our love grows, right? As we get deeper with God, and that love grows in us, and it grows through us, and it grows in the way that we express it. We get connected more to it. And then as that love comes stronger, such love has no fear. Do you see the correlation there? It's what the angels said. It's what my life experiences showed me, and it's what Scripture says so clearly. If we wanna deal with all that 2024 is gonna throw at us in the way of confusion and anxiety and fear, then maybe we need to make sure that we are grounded 
in our faith in Christ and doing the things in our lives to expose ourselves to that faith and to that love as much as we can. Yes? There's a family in our church, beloved family. They've been, go, they've been here as long as I have, which is a long time, been here 20 years. Um, Jane Warner, two days before Christmas, had a massive heart attack. Her daughter, right in front of her daughter. They were making Christmas cookies, I think, or working on some Christmas meal. And um, she in the hospital. Last night, we took her off of life support. Um, donated her organs. Through this process, right, it, when, at first they didn't know what the situation was going to be. There was some, some hope that maybe she would come out of it, even though she was on all kinds of tubes and everything. And then as the days went, they realized that there wasn't going to be a recovery from this. Um, and just sitting with the family, talk about fearful, right? Her mom, uh, Billy, is her husband's name. They're sitting there, and and they don't. They're confused. They're anxious. They don't know. They know it's bad, but they don't know how bad. And so we're talking through this, and we're praying. And what I see a lot of people and families do in situations like this is they'll pull back. They'll shrink within themselves. And they'll pull away from God, they'll pull away from each other, but this family was so good, they did just the opposite. They pulled towards one another. Because I think one of the best ways that God works and his love is made known in the world is through people. And so by staying open to each other, they stayed open to the love that they had from God through one another, and they stay open to God. They would pray with me, they would pray over their mom. Right? They continued to expose themselves to the love of God. Were they still sad? Yes. Were they still anxious and afraid? Of course. But it wasn't as bad as it would have been if they hadn't kept themselves open. This stuff has real life, real world application. So my friends, when the things that come into your lives, the fear-inducing things come in, overwhelm them by bringing in more God, by bringing in more Jesus. Because the more of Jesus and the more exposure you have to God in your life, the less that's going to affect you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, first of all, I just want to say a quick prayer for Jane's family as they say goodbye to her and deal with the reality that she is now with you. Thank you for the promise that you have given all of us for eternal life. But when all of us face the things in our lives that cause us anxiety or fear, hopefully not as bad as losing a loved one, but no matter what it might be, Lord, help us remember that the best antidote to that is to keep our eyes on you. And the more we keep our eyes on you and expose ourselves to you, the less control that that fear and anxiety is gonna have over us. Help us to be wise in 2024 as we face this bombardment of anxiety-producing media. A, help us watch less media, but B, Help us watch more Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name.